Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Merit Jano, Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs, and it's my real pleasure to welcome all of you here today. I think this is the first major forum of the academic year, and what a great way to start. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to uh, have uh, this discussion today because it's a chance for me to also welcome uh, Dr. Jeanette Wing, the new Avenisian Director of the Columbia Data Sciences Institute and Professor of Computer Science uh, to SIPA. It's our first uh, collaboration uh, together in what I know will be uh, ongoing collaboration on many fronts uh, this academic year and, and uh, going forward. The Columbia Data Science Institute really has emerged as a leader in both the foundational and interdisciplinary applications of data science. And of course, Columbia is one of the first universities to of offer a master's degree, I think, in, in uh, data science, uh, and indeed is collaborating deeply with SIPA and other parts of the university. Uh, Dr. Wing uh, has held uh, positions previously at Carnegie Mellon, the National Science uh, Foundation, um, and at Microsoft, so we're delighted to have her as a leader here at Columbia. Uh, for our part at SIPA, we have a very robust engagement around international security, national security, and increasingly cybersecurity and technology and policy through our Global Digital Futures uh, Policy Program that undertakes uh, research on cybersecurity, internet governance, the digital economy, has introduced a very robust uh, interdisciplinary curriculum that holds annual conferences, has digital-focused capstones and projects, inaugurated a New York uh, Financial Services Cyber Task Force, and indeed is committed to helping our students become uh, the next generation of leaders in the intersection of technology and public policy. So with this by way of backdrop, I, I think, uh, you know, the importance of cybersecurity has become, you know, very uh, deeply appreciated by all of us, but the frontier of academic learning uh, is vast, and uh, cooperation between jurisdictions, I think, still at an early stage. Um, so it's particularly a pleasure for me to uh, welcome Dr. Matanya and his colleagues here today as the director of, the, of Israel's National Cyber Directorate, um, an extraordinary institution that I'm sure he will share more about, and we're very honored to have you to have a discussion on cybersecurity in a global context. I think uh, to better introduce him and to give you more flavor for um, uh, his background. Uh, I'd like to also welcome Professor Udi uh, Summer to the podium, who is the Israel Visiting Professor at the Columbia University Department of Political Science and Associate Professor of Political Science at Tel Aviv University. And uh, Professor Summer has been a, a very active force in, in instigating this collaboration today and helping us think about ways uh, to uh, co collaborate in the future. So let me introduce Udi, and then we will have a fireside chat for a few minutes and open it up for you uh, to ask whatever questions you would like. So I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dean Jeno and Director Wing for uh, the warm welcome and for organizing the events today. Uh, Dr. Eviatar Matanya, our guest today, uh, whom I del I'm delighted to uh, present, is the Director General of the Israel National Cyber Directorate in the Prime Minister's office. Uh, he, was f he was appointed uh, founding director when the directorate was created six years ago. Mr. Matania is a graduate of the Elite Talpiot program. He holds a Bachelor of Science cum laude in Physics and Mathematics from the Hebrew University, a Master of Science cum laude in Mathematics from Tel Aviv, with an expertise in game theory, and a PhD, again, from the Hebrew University in Judgment and Decision Making. Mr. Matania has a vast experience at the national level with research and development projects and system analysis. Academically, his expertise is in judgment and decision making. And as Director General, he was involved in the establishment of a network of six cyber research centers in all the major Israeli universities, which are partly funded by the Directorate. Uh, we are delighted to have Dr. Matanya here with us for a two-day visit at Columbia University, and I'm very much looking forward to the event today and for a 
uh, enlightening and interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, so why don't I just get us started with uh, what we call a door opener and invite you to uh, share with us your perspective about Israel's uh, commitment to cybersecurity research and collaboration and how uh, your own agency works. So, um, I will go to the basics uh, um, when we uh, were established. The, uh, cyber, the National Cyber Bureau in Israel was established in order to lead Israel into the cyber arena after a decade of working uh, in defending our critical infrastructures. But it was then understood that it's not enough and we need a real uh, new comprehensive view about what to do. And uh, the government decided uh, to establish a specific bureau which will be responsible for that with three main objectives. One is to uh, develop a comprehensive cybersecurity strategy for the nation. Second, to build the uh, capacity of Israel to be one of the leaders in the world in cyber. And third, to lead all the uh, global and uh, internal policy of Israel in cyber domain. And now, wh when um, what we did is to uh, really develop a, a new strategy, a three-layer framework towards how we should uh, defend our nation. And we recommended to the government not just to adopt this strategy, but also to establish a new, uh, to a total new authority to be responsible for cover to cover, civilian authority for the defense of Israel in the cyber domain, named the Cyber Security Authority which was established uh, two years ago according to the governmental resolution that adopted our recommendations in February 15. And then uh, I call it as an operational arm of defending the nation, starting with the regulations, we're building our robustness, managing all of the events, working uh, uh, to manage the high campaigns against Israel, and it, it's behind working with our security forces and intelligence community of how uh, when we need, when there are some persistent attackers and they are going to, to go after them because the authority is um, concentrated in the attacks. Now, side by side, we were uh, instructed to build Israel as a global power. And why? Because uh, usually uh, when you look at Israel and uh, in our, at our very interesting neighborhood, we need to be a regional power, meaning that we have some nation states and uh, their organization to deal with, which I call it regional power. We need to be regional power. When it comes to cyber, people should understand that uh, since there are no borders, you are threatened by the whole world together. Each and every hacker, crime organization, terror organization, nation states, Superpowers may have some interest in doing to you something in cyber. So, being just a regional power is not enough. And from our point of view, since we are very anxious with our national security, it was decided we needed to be uh, a global power. Now, we do not compete with superpowers, please. It's okay. We are not a superpower, not in cyber, not everything, but a global power. So we were instructed to build the Israeli capacity, meaning technology, research, and an ecosystem of academia, industry, and human capital. So we will be able also in 5, 10, 15, and 20 years to remain and be one of the global power in, in cyber. And this, is, this is a, has a lot to do with research. Because if you really want to be power, you need research. You need universities to be in. You need cyber research centers, which we established, six research centers in technology, in uh, legal issues, psychology, education, everything, political sciences, everything which is needed. So we will uh, be a real power in the world and also influence the uh, global arena. And we will have someone to ask questions and to get some answers when we Need, uh, need them to do so. So in a whole, as an introduction, regarding your question, uh, Israel is moving in two main directions. One is a comprehensive national security strategy, which I think is must one of the <coughs> most advanced currently in the world, with an ecosystem of defense. Everyone knows exactly his job with a leading authority, a new authority, civilian one, a leading authority, 
which has the all the accountability and responsibility for the cyber defense of the nation. Usually in other countries, when you ask who is this accountable for the cyber defense of the nation, wherever you come, when, wherever you come from, there are no real answers or a list of names. We decided, according to our culture, or national security culture, that we need one and only centralization uh, in this issue, one accountability, and the authority is responsible for that. And in parallel, we are building our capacity, technological capacity, research, uh, uh, policy, everything in order to, with these two roads, to be a global power and uh, um, to cope with the security needs and also to use the uh, economical opportunities that we see in this uh, area. Thank That's you very great. much. I, I'd like to, you know, I, I had the uh, honor to have dinner with him last night and now lunch. And so I, he has said some remarkable statements, which I hope to tease out of him uh, through my questions, our questions. One of the things that I know Merritt is interested in this as well is that you make a clear distinction between an attack and an attacker. I'd like you to speak about that and how that, uh, taking that attitude changes um, your kind of, what you focus on on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the major issues in cyber is that uh, there are no borders and there is no domain of activity where you can take your security forces to deal with an attacker. And it's um, because the attacks come into your systems, into your organizations, which makes the organization the digital frontier of the nation. It's not just that. It's very difficult to all the time try and attribute the problem. Where I see missiles, I, you know, from there they come. So the attack and attacker are the same. I know exactly the missile, rockets, tanks, everything we know. So usually we combine attack and attackers. But in cyber, when you see something, you do not immediately attribute it. And it's in fact quite difficult to attribute. And from our point of view, most of the time, it really doesn't matter. The attack is an entity which we should mitigate. I don't care about who did WannaCry. I don't care why something happens to my banks or to, some, or to uh, uh, electricity production. Most of the time, I just need to defend. I need to build my organization to be robust enough so nothing happens. If something happens, to know how to contain it, how to recover, what to do. With persistent attackers, we will also need to understand the attacker. But most of the time, the attack is the most important thing. And this led us, not just you know, theoretically to say, OK, there are attacks and there are attackers. This led us to the understanding that we need a whole new authority which is focused on the attacks. The new authority, this is what we call the clean water. We need the water to be clean that everyone may get them. But if someone is doing something to our water, looking, you know, going after the one who is trying, you know, to do something to our water, this is the, the, the objective of our security forces. But the capability to see that the water are clean, this is, the, this is going after the attacker, not the attacker. And this is the objective and, uh, of the new authority that we, uh, uh, that we initiated. So this theory of differentiating between the attack and the attackers, which is so important in cyber, also led to a whole new structure of our government regarding the cybersecurity issue. So let me follow up with that, uh, with a question. Uh, at the risk of, of uh, understatement, let me say the relationship between the government and firms in this country is extremely complicated uh, uh, and has become more so in recent years with respect to cybersecurity and information sharing and um, questions of uh, what uh, firms are alerted to. Uh, that the government may know, for example, about uh, attacks occurring um, and when they're notified and not notified. And, and I think this is an evolving framework in this country, far from stable, I would say, or clear. Could you speak to that from Israel's perspective? Because uh, if you create a single agency and you have a commitment 
uh, to addressing attack, is your relationship with firms different than, for example, it is here? I believe they are because they, they are different. And one of the reasons, one, one of the reasons to establish the new authority was to differentiate, to separate all other missions from this authority. Meaning, for example, if you ask the police to be responsible, the police is an example, to be responsible also for uh, securing the nation from cyber attacks. So one day they come to a certain firm, tell them, let's see what happened in your systems. We need, and we work. And the day after they come and say, you know, we saw something there, which now we are going to investigate you. At, this couldn't happen. The new authority has no investigation. We do not investigate people. We do not search for them, not for crimes, not for other reasons. We just, this new authority is just focused on helping, supporting all the firms to be in a much better position with the cyber defense. Clear walls. And this is why it's very easy and, 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 and there is a lot of trust between the firms in Israel and the new authority. Now, of course there are problems. You need to build trust. You need to show that you are relevant. You need to put transparency on the table. You need to show them what you're doing with the information, how you do not uh, keep the, inf the private information, how you do not look for the private information, how you bring intelligence into the system so they show that you also bring something. It takes time to build, but I can tell you that from after more than a year of uh, activity in this field, we see a lot of trust and a lot of firms in Israel come, coming to work with the new authority, and we prefer that it will be this way, voluntary, uh, decisions to come and work with the authority. So to be concrete, if you are to find vulnerabilities in certain software systems that are that corporations produce, you would you would tell them. If I see a vulnerability in certain uh, like Microsoft software, for instance. If we see something, of, uh, I can give you an example. Uh, with WannaCry, most of the Israeli films were ready to WannaCry because as soon as we knew something, everything was shared immediately with all the films. Through the regulators, the ministries, it really doesn't matter the way that we did it. But uh, the, the objective of the authority is that the organizations will be well secured. As soon as we know about something, some attack, vulnerability, something which happens road everywhere for, from uh, different sets around the world, for, from different sectors in Israel. You know, one, most of the problem is cyber that most of the attacks, you, can, you have already seen them somewhere. But the same attack, you may use the same attack and release it everywhere because the fact that a specific bank saw it, is they don't understand what they saw and they don't know how, what to do with that. They do not share the information with other banks, not talking about other sectors. What we are trying to do is immediately when we know something to understand where we should put it and, who is, and, and what to do with this because it's not that any information is interesting anyone, but immediately to analyze and to take it to where it is needed. So I want to change the subject if you don't mind and um, ask about uh, new technology that is out there or already uh, coming. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically about a lot of the AI technology that people are using, machine learning to build models based on lots and lots of data. Um, and already there's a lot of interest in the academic community for um, basically uh, adversarial examples in using these models. Do you, uh, where, where does your uh, agency you know, stand in terms of what keeps you up at night in new technology that's coming? So, the uh, uh, certain technologies which do not keep me uh, wake at night because I hope them to come through so artificial intelligence. For example, I will give just one example. Currently, uh, there is a, a real shortage in analysts that it can really uh, analyze attacks, and this is labor intensive. Mm -hmm. The the limit of our capabilities to analyze more and more things is the number of analysts that we have. 
and that th this is, a, I, I think, this is a global problem. Mm -hmm. So I look and I search. I'm waiting for artificial intelligence capabilities to replace most of the labor-intensive work, for example. So from my point of view, AI is going to bring us a lot of automated algorithms and processes that will enable us to first replace analysts, second, to work much more faster, meaning that it will be automatically you know, between networks. And this is just an example. Something which I cannot say that uh, you know, keep me awake, uh, not, uh, not sleep at night, but uh, <laughs> some technologies. Uh, I have, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm coming from a neighborhood where there are a lot of reasons not uh, <laughs> to sleep well at night. Do you ever sleep? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, we used to say that uh, in the Middle East, simply it, you should not sleep well at night. <laughs> but if you ask me about, and, and it was mentioned before in, in our closed session, uh, quantum computing, for example. This is not going to be a, a linear change. Mm -hmm. you know, most of the time, we usually we can understand uh, linear changes, something which is going to change, but we, we can expect it. We understand, OK. It will not be like it will be double, triple. It will do like that. It will be faster. It will be oh, I will, there will be algorithms. We cannot really understand and and uh, how uh, I call nonlinear changes are going to influence us. Quantum computing is one of them, from my point of view, and this is something which I don't know what to do with. So we are initiating a work together with researchers, with universities not just to develop quantum computing, but to understand how it's going to influence cybersecurity, other things, you know, quantum uh, uh, encryption, quantum computing, which, which are different. How it's going to influence everything. It's not just our problem, by the way. It's a problem of the whole internet and other issues. So this is something which you ask me, I'm afraid of non-linear changes, mm -hmm. something which is a, like a crisis. This is where I, I don't know exactly what to do. With other things, we can correct. If I understood you properly, your, your central focus as an agency is on dealing with the attack itself and helping uh, the country and firms respond to it effectively and protect themselves against future attacks. But that helps you uh, be a thinker in the entire field of, of cybersecurity and escalation. And I guess, uh, you know, I feel that uh, this is um, an area that needs a lot of thought and international conversation and understanding. And I wonder if you have some thoughts on what you see as particularly escalatory and how we should think about when cyber attack is a kinetic uh, matter. So very first, just um, to make it clear, um, in the directorate, we have two organizations. One is operational arm, the authority, the new authority. One is the bureau responsible for the capacity building and the policy. And I am also not just the head of the directorate, but an advisor to the government and the prime minister regarding the whole issue of cyber. I'm not directly responsible for cyber power, which is part of the walls of the Israel Defense Forces. Uh, uh, regarding some escalations of future thinking about cyber. so. I will answer if it's okay with you with several examples. One is IoT. From my point of view, IoT is the next step of cyberspace because cyberspace is growing all the time. More and more computer systems, uh, telecommunication networks are connected into one big space. It's not, uh, and it's growing. IoT is going to multiply it by 100. So if you ask me one of the uh, most, uh, one of the real challenges and, and something which may escalate everything that you know about cyber is the IoT. Second, regarding some uh, global issues. I think that currently most of nations are in the process of understanding what to do nationally. Meaning we haven't yet solved the problem of going from organizations into the national level. We do not really understand the difference, and it's not the same. The nation is more than just the sum of all those organizations. That's what we did. And I see around the world that nation states are trying to solve the problem of what to do nationally. And they, uh, I think that the next step will be what to do globally. 
So we have already seen some uh, you know, experience uh, with some detailing manual, for example, regarding international law. We saw the GGE of the United Nations trying to put some norms on the table. I think it's just the beginning. I think that during the, the next decade, we will have to put something on the table regarding these issues. Now, we have our ideas. Uh, we believe in a different approach to global norms. We think it's very important. And because it's so important, we need to go quite narrow and accurate. I just give an example. Not to say we need a lot of norms, not to do that, and not to do that, and not to do that, and not to do that, because every sign, everyone will sign but do nothing with this. We need to have it very narrow, very accurate, but something which everyone and every nation may cope with, and to build some stability. I'm coming from game theory, so some equilibrium, and above this equilibrium to try and build the next store, the third store, and the fourth store. Now, norms is, is not the whole issue of global agenda. I think that our three layers framework, which we developed for national uh, aspects, is also suitable for trying to see what the global agenda should be. What can we do globally regarding robustness? What can you do globally regarding resilience? It's, uh, should we uh, initiate some programs, some uh, global certs? some uh, global research center which may uh, help countries and big organizations. How we connect between global companies which they are real partners. It's not just nation states. Nation states and global companies such as Google, Microsoft, Amazon and other, Akamai, which have you know, a lot of interest in the cyberspace. I think we are just in the beginning of this global agenda, very important for our point. Last night you mentioned um, an example of one particular, perhaps commonality of, of a, a, a global norm that, or social norm that you yes. could imagine countries agree on. You want to say, this is the financial. I wanted you to get that one out. Yes, uh, again, when I'm talking about a very narrow and accurate norms, I can give an example, which is the integrity of financial da data. The integrity of financial data, it's hard to see who, is, who could be against it. I think that <laughs> all <laughs> nation states and crime organizations, and they, they will be in favor of, uh, of the integrity of financial data. I'm not talking about stealing money. I'm talking about the integrity of the financial data, which I think is basic for the world economy, for the world financial sector. And this is an example. You could think about others. I'm not giving you the solution. This is an example to what I'm trying to put on the table. Let's go for one, two, or three very accurate norms, which everyone, almost everyone, OK, there is never all, everyone may agree with. Let's build some mechanism regarding this norm. What we, how we are going to cope with them? What we are going to do? Procedures, systems. Once we have it, we can talk about the next stage. Do you? Uh, what, what is your opinion about this idea of a digital Geneva Convention? Uh, so, you know that currently there is only one. I call it only one treaty. That you know the Budapest uh, Agreement regarding the cyber crime. All the other digital agendas currently that I see are something to do with putting uh, norms or, or, or the right behavior of what to do. It's important. I think it's part of the process. This is not, this is not a solution. This is a process which I think is very, is very good. Mm -hmm. So you, I'm sure you uh, studied the US-China cyber agreement. Um, which uh, embedded some principles about non-interference uh, for commercial purpose uh, by states. Do you have a reaction to that agreement? Did you think it was a, a constructive step? I think that all, all these kind of steps, of steps are constructive. Uh, I am not sure about uh, every step, if it's, it's going to last for and for how many years and how real it is. But the fact that nation states and companies are talking, the fact that you try to put something on the table to talk about the norms, the discussions, from my point of view, this is what's important, the procedure. Mm -hmm. okay. Should we open it up? Yes, should we open it up? See what kind of questions we have. Um, so you talked about 
talk about the close collaboration with industry. Uh, when we look at the data, the bulk of the breach is due to behavior. Fishing, failure to apply updates, Equifax, for example, does not apply updates. Is there a regulatory framework in Israel that enforces greater behavioral compliance for cybersecurity, or just people are more responsive? Okay. Good question. Um, First, the, the, there is a regulatory scheme. And it, it changes according to the importance of the organization from, the, from national security interest or for moral hazard. If it's, uh, so the, the more important or critical the organization is, the more regulation it has. Meaning that uh, when you're talking about, about critical systems, this is tough regulation, very tough. When we are, you know, going uh, down, it becomes less tough until there is nothing. And now, I do agree that in Israel, usually there is a notion of security, and people usually, they, you, by the way, usually Israelis do not know how to behave. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, and they are, and you know, usually if there is some instruction, we do like this with these interactions because the interactions are, are for others. <laughs> you know, when I come to the States and I stand in a line and uh, uh, I just want to ask something, sir, please, sir, this is the line. Okay. <laughs> in Israel, we used to say, just a question. <laughs> and the line in Israel is not the line, it's like this, you know, because. So we usually, Israelis, they don't like instructions, it doesn't work but they have a notion of security. This is the difference. So when you try to count it, I think that the notion of security, together with what we are trying, the awareness that we are trying to build, is, is something which is going to make uh, a better behavior in most organizations. Because they will immediately want to protect themselves, their families, yes. and when you're doing this locally, it builds out. Yes, and, and just another example of the differences, if in Israel, Half of the population will be hacked with its uh, credit card information. Or if something happens to uh, three hospitals, a moment after, a moment after, what will be the question in Israel? Where is the government? <laughs> Prime Minister, Prime Minister, answers. You talked about cyber power, authority, investment. Where is the government? Immediately. So people, the notion of security is something which enables us to demand. Now, it, it takes time. It's not, again, behavior. It takes time to build the awareness of the right behavior. But I think that we have some basis for this mm -hmm. because of, of these uh, facts. That's great. Yeah. Other students? And I, I, I will tell you something from uh, my point of view regarding open source. I cannot change the world, nor the software arena, nor everything. So I have to live with it. Okay. Live with we it. We need to live with it. That's yeah, it. But it's the government's fund. 
And there are some advantages in open sources, you know, because the, you are right that in open sources uh, everyone knows what's happening and you find vulnerabilities, but again, everyone knows and find vulnerabilities, meaning we, have, we can fix it. Just think about closed uh, sources, okay? If someone finds vulnerability, what is the chance it is going to reveal it or we can use it and who will else will know it? In open sources, usually, you know, white hackers also find these vulnerabilities, so the pros and cons for everything. If I, I was once asked in our government, okay, what we are going to recommend, to use open source for the software in the government or, or not open source? We decided not to recommend, this is good, this is good, I prefer there will be all of them together in order to, be able to have redundancy and, and different kind of software and tools. Okay. People, there are people, for example, we had the data at the Dow Herbert community, for example, and many, many more, I and mean, there's lots of open source projects that are critical and unfunded by any organization. So the government is that. That's right. Your government, the US government. I'm a government. Never to pay. <laughs> I am a government. Never to pay. And my question is in developing like countries, you know, imagine kidnapping, the policy on paying depends a lot on the capacity of the government to prosecute and to find the, the, the perpetrator. But most of like 80% of the countries around the world don't have that capacity. So actually the government advises the people to pay the kidnapper. So would you still like hold that same advice for well? all? I, I will have several remarks, okay? One, regarding uh, attacks such as WannaCry. We had different attacks similar to this, not WannaCry, but other, that uh, uh, went, um, you know, too high. Meaning, when you are, if you try to go after a bank, which may cause a problem to all our financial system, this is one thing. If you just ask, you know, from the bank something and you not uh, threaten it, it's another thing. What I mean, banks will pay. But once it's a threat to the whole bank, it's a problem of the government. And now we're going after you. So if you go too high, it's a question of what you're doing. Second thing, we as a government recommend you to, uh, to keep your data in the right way and never to pay. I am not responsible for what you decide to do. But if it comes to hospitals or to government, never. I simply do not hear you. Well, I, I do agree that uh, there are more, there are weaker organizations and processes and infrastructures. And uh, first, we, we, we share the doctrine and expertise with everyone. By the way, we also translate it into English. Because there is nothing secret with the doctrines. The, the, the issue is how to implement it and which technologies to use and exactly what you are doing in your systems. Now. We know that uh, if you want to uh, defend a critical system, you have a problem with the procurement or supply chain or a lot of other organizations in the process. We know that. So usually what, what we change with our uh, doctrine from the past is that we are now 
do not look just um, at the critical system, but the critical process. Meaning how to have the process defended. And in the process, we found, you know, some very weak organizations that we didn't understand before that they were part of the process and should be defended, not just, you know, the electrical grid, something like this. So now we look, we are just in the beginning of trying to look at procedures and then we identify all the process and also the weak uh, organizations in between and we give them the right expertise to be in the right place, even when they are very small. I hope it answered the question. So, question over here. We, we are moving in two uh, major directions with this. One is the awareness and trying to explain. But my point of view is that forever there will be those who do not understand, who do mistakes, use the password one, two, three, four, even if we explain them. I just think about <laughs> my mother-in-law. <laughs> She has five, six. Right. <laughs> yes. No, she, and there were, I don't want to talk about my wife. <laughs> what exactly <laughs> she, but she knows that she has to phone me. Oh, there is something, just please tell me. What I'm trying to say, that there will always be those who do not understand and we cannot ask them to be too technological. We need, I'm looking at it from the nudge point of view, how to build it so arrows if you know uh, there are some subways where you put the ticket like this, or like this, or like this, or like <laughs> this, everything is okay. There are some subways, if you don't put it in the right way, oh, it, it, something happens. I hate it. So the same with cyber. We need to build a system that, are, you know, that you may make mistakes, that you can make mistakes, and you don't have to be so careful about what you're doing or where your passwords are. I think, so when I'm talking about moving in two directions, one, yes, is to build awareness, but the second one is to take technology in order to overcome all the human problems. Just think about it. In separated uh, uh, systems of the army, for example, you cannot make mistakes. Usually when you make mistakes, immediately it doesn't work, it doesn't let you make the mistake. You cannot put a disk on key which is not okay. You cannot do a lot of things because people are making mistakes. So the same should be. Technology should overcome our human problem. That's the way I see it. It's a very nice. Back there. Hi. I will start first with just um, emphasizing that also in Israel, those who are responsible for the networks are the organizations, the CEO of the organizations. The government is not responsible for the cybersecurity of the specific organization. But in parallel, we know that there is a limit to what we can expect from an organization because it doesn't have the real critical mass of knowledge, understanding, or ability 
to stand in front of some real attack or terrorist attack. That, that's the difference. But it's your responsibility. We will help you. We will give you the information. We will work with something. It's your responsibility to do the right thing. So the responsibility the Israel and the United States is the same. I think that the difference in the, is the, what the government believes its role is. We think that uh, uh, we have a lot of experience coming from terror, for example, or from other issues. You need to do what you need to do according to regulation, to our recommendations, but we will help you. As soon as you do what you need to do, we will help you, we will support you, we will connect you to everything in order to help you. Why? Because we need your business to be you know, more secure, because sometimes there are moral hazards because of your organization. Sometimes your national interest. Okay, we will do, and the, uh, the regulation, again, will be more, will be tougher if you are so critical and less if you are not. Now, regarding the United States, my uh, uh, first answer always is, look, I do not advise superpowers. I come from a small country. This is totally different scale. And I believe that, uh, you know, most of the time, being so small, we have a lot of disadvantages. And, but there are some advantages. In cybersecurity, you are trying to use these advantages mm -hmm. in being so small. It's not so difficult to connect all the sectors together in one place and to centralize. We know each other. We know the sisters. How many sisters are there in Israel? We can take them all into one theater and tell them what they should do. And they will come to this meeting. Of course. <laughs> we invite them. It's uh, very close. You know, yeah. Israel is small. Yeah. They, they will come. Yeah. Yes. When we ask, they come. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> now, what I'm trying to say, really, that yeah, I think the, the problem of scale. Now, mm -hmm. what we are doing is very good to small to medium countries. When it comes to a country like the United States, this is a different culture, different way. You have state. You, you don't just, just have federal administration and organization. You have states in between. You have very strong sectors. You have very strong ministries. For example, the DOE, with all its critical infrastructure and grids and everything, and with the laboratory, it's more than whole Israel together. So DOE has enough critical mass in order to do what's needed in cybersecurity. In Israel, Ministry of Energy, cannot do that. I work with the Ministry of Energy together. I work with the financial sector together because they are too small to succeed by themselves. The advantage is that we bring all the knowledge and understanding into one place and that's why we can move fast. So I do not want to advise. I can just stay and put on the table I think that the notion of the difference between attack and attackers is very important. And this will be the starting point of addressing the right solution in the United States. As soon as you differentiate between these two, it will be easier to understand who is responsible for what, what is exactly the role of the government, and who should do what. Now, you will find the right answer, which will be different than ours. If I may take the liberty of asking the last question, because yes. uh, I haven't heard you speak to this. From your perspective, where would you like U.S.-Israel cyber cooperation to go in the government-to-government -government level? In the government level? Yeah. U.S. is the number one strategic uh, alliance of Israel in cyber. Not just in cyber, by the way, but of course in cyber. We are working very hard, and we initiated several months ago after uh, working for several years a strategic cooperation with the federal administration, with all the different departments. I hope it will bring us to the ability to think together about strategies and policies, uh, to take the good things from each other, to see Israel as a laboratory and then a pilot for things for the United States, to share information operationally, and to also uh, make some R&D together. I hope for all this, and that's what I'm trying to do. That's yeah. why I'm here. Thank you so Great. much. Thank Please you. join me in thanking Dr. McCann.